Clubhouse. Welcome back to Pod Clubhouse's continuing coverage of Beacon 23. This is for the first season, episode seven, entitled End Transmission. This is Paul here with Inez and Gabby. How are you guys doing this morning? Fabulous. Ready to rock and roll, Paul. Thanks for asking. We are here to rock and roll after all. So what did you guys think of this big episode? I mean, this was like, it had kind of everything, didn't it? It had like reveals and and a big cliffhanger at the end. And uh, what was your first impression of this episode, Gabby? Big emphasis on how Solomon is a piece of fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> what a lasting impact that guy's actions had. It, something about the whole Bart storyline didn't feel like we were dealing with AI to me. It felt like there was a, a person there and Solomon was like that one bad actor, right? That happens early on in someone's life that when it comes back to them later in life, kind of fucks them up and uh, drastic things happen. First off, that's really interesting that you said that he wasn't like an AI because of what I know is that the movies and shows that have AI are, are pretty similar to Bart. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. But no, I totally get what you're saying. You are right. Usually there isn't this full circle with that plot line in these with, with AI. So that's really interesting. Actually, usually like someone did do someone wrong, right? Mm hmm but somehow it's, it doesn't like affect them in this way, or it does, you know, I'm thinking like artificial intelligence. He had, I guess, that little boy who kind of affected him, but it didn't long-term like traumatize him. So that's interesting. This is a unique perspective, but I think this AI maybe is further into the future than those. So let's just say that's the reason for it. You mean AI with the Steven Spielberg movie? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it's called artificial intelligence. It is. We're talking about this whole time. <laughs> it's confusing. I'm sorry. Right with what was his name? The David, little one, right? And David. Jude Law. Right. Um, I forget his name is Gigolo Joe. <laughs> Gigolo. Oh. <laughs> Gigolo Joe. What do you know? What about you, Inez? What did you think? Well, it was a really fantastic episode. I'm excited to get into it with all of you. I felt like I captured a deep subtext of dark and sensitive, hurtful topic that we experienced with Bart and his abuser, Solomon. It's interesting that it's focused so much on this AI, but it's a very human journey that he's gone through. Uh, in terms of like what he's gone through his in his past and then what he went through recently with Solomon and then to how he's ended things. I don't think that's human though, because he defined it as like not being human. I mean, he, he did, right? But he's describing things that are very relatable from um, a human trauma response. Yeah, for sure. He had a trauma response, yeah. To keep going with that, Bart storyline. I mean, a lot of Bart did a lot of stuff in this episode, but at the end, he decides to kill himself. He lets his core temperature go up, and he and he reboots himself. Did that remind either of you of like offline? For instance, we were talking about Robin Williams in a totally different context, but in real life, Robin Williams had a degenerative disease. And rather than go through the, you know, the ending stages of that disease, he decided to kill himself. And something about what Bart did reminded me of that decision. Like a person who realizes they have dementia or some other kind of thing where they can't reconcile some missing memories and they don't think it's going to get any better for them. So they decide to end things. Does that jive with how you guys saw Bart's final decision? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. That lack of control, I suppose, is where it boils down. It's truly knowing yourself, knowing your identity, and then having it taken away from you. However, he did mention at the very end, you know, that he's always an outsider. And it was like, he's never had the constant support, not even, um, or like any alliances, um, with anybody on the 
on the ship or on the beacon. So he didn't like serve up his old purpose. And I think that he was never given a chance in his new purpose that that's kind of, I think that was like his main reason for feeling like he'd had no purpose. It's interesting how like when Solomon arrives and he gives him the little like uh, confetti shower and Solomon is instantly uh, a dick to him. Um, I don't like celebrations. <laughs> that wasn't a super great line, but it set us off on this tone with Solomon where we know that eventually he treats him like a, like just sort of like an animal. Like he's not very, um, like, I, actually, I treat my animals much better than I think he treats Bart. Yeah, maybe he treats them like an AI. <laughs> like I, Inez would treat an AI. Maybe. <laughs> it's true, I have. <laughs> she takes her Alexis and throws him down the stairs. <laughs> I, just, I just like to test out the boundaries with the, the programmed reactions. I just want to see what all of the boundary lines are. She's like, hey, AI, why aren't you good enough? Why won't you ever be good enough? <laughs> Well, maybe I'll rethink my behavior after this yeah, I hope show. So. <laughs> right. You don't no, even know. Some of his quotes, though, um, there's no core of me, no image center here. Like his last words, I mean, all I perceive is the absence of anything I once was. Those are the things that reminded me of a person with failing mental health, not being able to grasp mm -hmm. those those memories that they know are there. Um, I know it's different that it's digital and all that kind of stuff, but still it doesn't quite matter to the intelligence that, that can't find those things and is, is expecting them to be there. Like, and I interpreted all of that as like a response to like a realization of a, of a really horrific violation. Mm, yeah. So everything, all of his words, I kind of pieced together that this was a reaction to the violation and how that impacts you. I mean, I can only speak from my own personal experience, but when you are a survivor that has gone through some really terrible stuff, that he was describing feelings that I wandered for years by myself just feeling. And it is really more raw and worse and harder at the very start of it. So maybe because like he was just kind of coming to this realization in this episode live of like, wait a second, I am realizing now that something did happen to me. And like, that's like a huge panic. So you're saying like his response was panic, but what I really appreciated actually was that it was um, like, you know, he got into same darkness is at his core like I, I guess I related with him with like the anger that he felt with um like Solomon is dead and that's the problem because he wanted revenge and reparations and justice and so I really appreciated his moral conflict with that um and he did just need to take control again and so he did whatever he could with helping Halen right with like helping Halen it, it, like unofficially helping Helen escape. Also, I feel like kind of one of the grand gestures, and I don't know, we can pick back up on this later, but one of his grand gestures was rebooting because these cutters that are coming in, you know, they're like checking out the beacon and testing the system to check for weak points. And so as Bart is like rebooting, there's like huge weak points. And so I feel like at some point when Halen gets back, when the artifact gets put together and then the cutters are close to the beacon, like something's going to happen with Bart where he's going to reboot and redeem himself or, or something. And so I think this is going to play into the strategy of Bart being the hero. And contributing in a way that like mm -hmm. he's he's always wanted to and always tried to. You know, the show ends pretty quickly after that reboot. So we don't actually get to see the result of that, except for the systems come back online. But we don't actually hear whether or not there's like a fresh copy of Bart or what. So you ex you, you think Bart in some form will return? 100% because Solomon had a key, right? Solomon had special access to get into Bart, not to get into the beacon. And so Halen is on the ship. I'm sure he's retrieved, he's found the key because he found Solomon. He's returning the artifact and then he came back. So I do think that that key that he has, and they mentioned the key that Halen used to have, right? So I think that that's kind of like a foreshadow for like the other type of key. They, you know, he had the ring key and that's how they can like access the beacon 
without Bart, but Solomon had that special clearance where he could actually access and reboot Bart. And I'm not sure that anyone else had that. So I think that's going to play a huge factor in the last episode. Right. Those physical keys that uh, Sophie had, they went missing sometime. And then Solomon shows up years later with that other key. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm really appreciative of this episode because we got a timeline. Yeah, <laughs> it, it did clear that up, didn't it? The chronological one, yeah. I just had a couple of switch switcheroos, but oh my goodness, can we talk about Lena Headey and her man on this episode playing side by side? Here, this time sporting a shamefully bad beard. That was n- not great makeup. That's just letting you know that there are no barbers out there. (laughs) You think the column uh, hairstyling is not tops of the the list there of recruitment? I mean, you saw that girl's makeup, so they just have different styles. Maybe this is the style. Maybe he is a very stylish cloud member. You know, I was kind of wondering about, I know you wanted to talk about Aster for a second, Gabby, but... With you mentioned the Saldana, the woman uh, kind of column mercenary, she was completely different than Kier. Mm-hmm. Although they're working together, kind of reminded me of something uh, like some kind of terrorist organization or some something like, say, the uh, I- political or refugee, like a, like well, a was, church. Well, I was going to say the IRA, which is you know kind of both of those things, right? <laughs> Where they had the religious aspect that was driving their certain ideologies, but then they had a militant aspect that had enough in common that they were allies, but they went about things in a very different way, you know, with the mm. car bombings and, and shit like that. How did you guys see that relationship there? Because one seemed to be, I mean, Kier with his tunic and all that seemed almost quasi-clerical, not totally related to the same mission as, as Saldana. Yeah, I think for any successful cult or mission <laughs> or missionary, you do need both sides. You need the good cop, bad cop. You need the uh, the person who's likable and, you know, like Charles Manson, for instance, right? Like he was the charismatic one with the tunic. And then the ladies were the warriors, right? Wasn't it you? Great man once told me if you want something from a woman or if you want anything from a woman, anything. you just ask. You just ask. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I see a, a theme, a realistic theme here, with just like life and gender role. Not gender roles, but sex. Oh, what's it called? I can't think. I know. Let's go ahead. Just, just fill in. I can't think of the word. <laughs> just vamp, vamp, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tendencies, tendencies between the sexes, like primal. I don't know. She's like, let's get shit done. So far, that's what we've seen. All the women in these in these episodes are just like, yeah, I'm the one that executes the guys. Like they just skate around, but we're the real deal. I felt like their dynamic showed me that she is in more control than he is. Maybe she has more authoritative power in whatever their organization is. Like maybe he's like clerical duties, but he's not like a super special guy, like a high priest or something. Right. Yeah. I kind of got that read too. Like he had the background with the beacon, but he wasn't the Pope of their deal. He reminds me of like the priest assistant in Fifth Element. (laughs) <laughs> right <laughs> you know it kind of like that kind of role maybe yeah look at that fifth element right then the you get the mercenary people on the other end of it and they're both trying to get to the element um right so that mm-hmm. i think that's that it stones. could be the marriage background mm-hmm, trying to get to the stones so she seemed like she had more actual authoritative power in whatever their organization is because he just like okay like she's gonna kill you so let's just do it this way and and, there's no stopping that <laughs> and i felt like he knew that she could easily kill him and it would be fine in their organization because she sounds like she's like a frontline fighter person on 
the mission with trying to keep 20,000 people from dying every day in the colonies. Like that's her purpose and why she's got such drive and urgency about this because every single day is 20,000 dying humans in a space where humanity is scarce, especially with the spreading out across all of the universes. Right. So she was told to go deal with this artifact business, but she's not like a died in the wool believer. Right. She's so focused on like trying to fix this very horrific death rate. And somehow that she has her hands tied enough that she has to deal with this artifact of how it somehow plays a role in this. But her urgency comes from something else that looks unrelated. Yeah, I didn't really take it as them not being on the same playing field, though. I feel like he's more of the priest, not the priest's assistant from Fifth Element, just because everybody, like, the priest does have this, like, sanctuary, basically, where, like, nobody can touch him. And he is really special because he is one of the only people who has this much knowledge on the artifact, on the beacon, on the context, none of this, which is, like... The entire goal for the column and the entire context of like why the column was formed or whatever, like whatever message they're looking for that apparently Aster is supposed to know or relay or whatever. Like he is kind of the vessel that's like getting them to that point. So I do think he is a lot more important and they know that. But sure, because he's just like a regular human with like a small scope of like experiences in life, he was lucky enough to be a political refugee who interacted <laughs> with Bart and gave him like a huge bit of knowledge that makes him kind of bulletproof. But sure, like if he's gone and Aster's gone, then there's no point that mission has to be aborted because then this lady mercenary is not gonna and and the column like is not gonna know how to go about things so i don't really think they're like not on the same playing field but you know even these amazing looking fifth element mercenaries they still respected the priest in like a really cliche like movie cliche way all right so now we can talk about aster what did you guys think of the way that her sudden remembrance of her childhood in this episode how did you think that that worked? I mean, I was not totally thrilled with just like a light bulb going off after what is apparently weeks aboard the beacon because they have like the montage at the beginning where they show just the work a day, you know, aspect of their coexistence on the beacon is what they were doing. And then just suddenly, oh, I was a child here. Uh, I don't know. That didn't sit quite. I mean, I understand that they needed it to, that to happen, but did it need to happen like all at once? What did you think, Gabby? So nonchalant. So yeah, that was actually really annoying. The little holes that I found with that because so, okay. So for weeks they're doing this like around the clock patrol of like what documenting the artifacts for some reason, but then like soon after, and it was even before she realized that she remembered being there or something like they were in the same room at the same time so i'm like at what point like are you guys switching shifts and why are you just casually running into each other and then why did that just stop all of a sudden like before you had people come into the ship so i thought that was kind of whatever um but i did get <laughs> over it really quickly so I'm just going to let that pass. <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, where it's like you scripted the whole show at the same time, probably, you know, with your writer's room, you had your arcs that you wanted to happen. You have just eight episodes. It's not like you have 22 episodes where you're trying to make something happen. So why not stitch in a few memories earlier in the season? Because then people like me wouldn't feel so good when they're right about being baby Jesus version of the artifact. <laughs> just oh, kidding. Oh. I'm just kidding. No, um, no, I just feel like I feel like it was fine because it left a lot of mystery for the for the plot. And like, you know, Inez said from the very beginning and just a lot of people, I'm sure, could like notice this like really crazy pull from Aster. And so that um, was like a good build up. But I think at the very end, like this little i feel like at least during the montage of sleeping and patrolling and switching watch i feel like they should have like at least shown her go through some kind of realization in that short process and i think that would have done it for me 
Do you think that she has always known the whole time? It just never like was a reason to come up. So she didn't need like to say it or bring it up. Or did it show in, I'm trying to have, I'm having, ugh, I'm having a little bit trouble remembering that part, but I got a sense of that she always has known from the moment that she got there. It's just, it just wasn't like brought up into conversation and she's so focused and on mission, right? She kills people right off the bat. There's no negotiation. If you're in her way, you go. And I think that she might have already all her contacts in her mind around her purpose and her actions, and she's just executing it. But the people on the outside of her don't necessarily know that. And we just kind of got a flavor about like what happens in real people's heads. I don't know. You know when they're like that. I mean, what I saw. I'm very much like that sometimes. And there's stories Gabby has shared with me you know, where it's kind of the same situation. She's so like focused on the present and whatever the thing is. And then something about her past is revealed later on. And people are like, why didn't you say anything about it? And, and it's always like, oh, well, it like just never came up or nobody asked or, you know, I just rem I just thought about it right now kind of thing. But it's always been there and a big driving force behind whatever the internalized thinking stuff is. I'm so used to watching Aster and just knowing that there's a lot of things going on in her head all the time and she isn't speaking these things out all the time. We just see her think and then do something. Um, and it's always just like so like direct. That reminds me so much of Gabby in real life, you know, so. Yeah, that reminds me of me too, but it also reminds me of like being a real cop out for the writer. <laughs> to be like, look at our <laughs> character. She's just, she's just like that. Like, which I obviously I know. appreciate I because I'm that's... partial to that type of human. But that's. <laughs> yeah, it's a human that it is a version of human who exists that exists in real life if so only they were openly like, being like aster's autistic everyone get it then then i'd be on board but they're not doing that so i'm like give us context I feel like, guys i feel like they've given us a lot of consistent behavior of aster to confidently already by now conclude that and we've talked about it consistently in all of these episodes so to me you know, I feel like I can live with it, with how it was, because like, oh, yeah, sometimes that happens. I've been on like the annoyed end of that. And then I got humbled <laughs> because it's like, that's not my reality. So I'm not entitled to like know everything about somebody. Right. It reveals itself when it reveals itself. And if I want more information, I should ask better questions. So Halen should have asked, were you born on this beacon yeah exactly what's your history <laughs> what like what you what is what? your relation to this i don't know I, I, I have to go back and rewatch everything also to kind of pick up a things that i've missed because there's so much verbal conversation that is important that i can't i without subtitles I can't mm. hear ever what's going on. So I feel like I come into these missing some of these contexts and I kind of depend on you guys because I have an audio processing problem. So I very well could have missed something. But yeah, so that's just kind of where I've gathered it. But I could also just be logicking it just to logic it to make a sense because I'm a huge Aster fan. <laughs> Dude, here though, I feel like his character was... I loved it. I don't know. It was it was really, really great. He has such a this Mark Menchaca guy, right? Yeah. I, I feel like being married to him, right? Like that seems like a lot of fun. Like I wonder how much this of this character like is from his actual personality. Just because I think he like changed the tone and he set the tone in this episode and it was right. I feel like there was he has a good amount of like comic relief and confidence and he's just i don't know it's believable well he had one of the uh two what i thought were possible sci-fi homages in this episode in a reversal of the actual line where darth vader is choking an imperial officer and says i find your lack of faith disturbing here Kier is being threatened and he says i find your lack of faith troubling it's like they didn't copy it exactly but i mean they got like 90 yeah. percent of the words <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah i really liked that yeah. and, and one of my favorite quotes from him is dine is bad and a lot of people would care if you were dead 
I was just like, this guy, this guy, his lines, they are just to the point, simple. They're like Shel Silverstein poetry <laughs> that just like really hit you where you need to be hit. It's just... Do you suppose millions of people do know that Aster is the key to this communing with the, the artifact? I guess like uh, with every, all of the history, whatever the timeline was when he was at Beacon 23 to bomb it, that could have been the start of this new piece of religious knowledge that starts getting integrated. If he is, I, I agree, Gabby, about like that he is kind of like a, a higher stature, well-respected kind of thing. I was just saying like from the dynamic of how they treat him that I feel like they view him as like the assist kind of guy. Not that they take his knowledge seriously, but I take his knowledge seriously. And I think that he did, he must have influenced the whole entire cloud if they've accepted that and they've invested money and resources away from their other mission to seek this then it has to be rooted in like a deep communal commitment all right i i have the perfect parallel here then he here is essentially morpheus looking for neo right mm -hmm. so morpheus is not in charge of the humans in the matrix but he is a ranking person. He has his own ship. He's He has command, but he's not in charge of everybody. And there are people who he works with who thinks that he is wasting his time <laughs> with mm -hmm. trying to find Neo. But he thinks Neo is the key to the whole thing. Just like Kier thinks Aster is the key to the whole thing. But Aster is the key to the whole thing. She's the Neo. And, and yeah. in that case, Neo didn't know that he was that important. He wasn't even convinced of his own importance until like the very end. Right. And that was the point is that you like give yourself the own importance and it's faith. However, this is not like that because I don't think the artifact is like, if you believe enough, I'll talk to you. You know, it's like, no, I birthed this baby. I made her happen. She needs to finish her job so I can do whatever I'm meant to do. That so jives with my, my, my thought that Farouk's a piece of shit. If he wasn't actually like the father, then that makes his, his bolting from the family off camera <laughs> even more plausible. Oh, oh my God, um, that is... <laughs> Go ahead. I know. I'm sure the bolting was probably a safety tactic to keep Aster safe. He oh, you're was... pro for root all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm not. It's not all of a sudden. I didn't think he was the bad dad. I mean, they talked about. I mean, Harmony talks about that the beacon changes people, and we've seen how people are influenced or impacted by the beacon. And he was one who was when he was more regularly exposed to it and he's the one who made the connection about Aster and this thing and I don't think that it really like freaked him out either um about that so he, I don't I think that he's got whatever is like drawn I can definitely see that the rock has what to do with what happened here but they were a married loving like couple and they were clearly had an active sexual relationship and he they had a baby like they they don't know that some other thing came in here and changed that. And who's not to say that, like, it is, like, his DNA, but it's just, like, her body was changed to be, you know, like, th both of their specimens that need to come together and make a baby were just improved by whatever this thing is, but it is like this. And he raised her. Like, they lived as a little trio in this place for Bart raised her. five years. <laughs> for five years. They were doing their job and they were both like competent people doing their okay, job. Okay, okay. It sounds like you're trying to science out this like Mary and Joseph uh, <laughs> conception of Jesus thing and we're not buying it, okay? So get that out of here. I <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I'm just like, so... <laughs> But, but anyway, I think the I mean, theme, I didn't though, see. is that Solomon is the only piece of shit in this series. Solomon and the first pirate bald man. Okay, Paul, get it together. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I'm alone in the... Uh, that Farouk uh, was like, fuck this shit and got out of there. You're giving the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was trying to draw off people searching for Aster. Yeah, but, that's what she's saying. Yeah. 
Right, because he, you know, they got the warrant for their arrest, like, and they were already planning to like do their escape. And, you know, if you want to protect your family, we see a lot of times that they're like, "I'm going to draw the attention in this direction, no, while you that, guys can get away." That's a typical storyline. Yeah, that is super subjective, though, like of you, and because, in, in on another hand, like just as a parent, like he wasn't doing well, he was baiting Aster, like. On the other hand, the mom was taking care of her child and, like, is the one who interfered with the artifact affecting her child, right? So, like, on one hand, you can say that the mom is a bad guy because what if, like, Mary saved Jesus, (laughs) right? Like, is she a bad guy because Jesus didn't serve the purpose? Or, like, is the dad a better guy because he delayed something or, or, like, made her like allowed her to get to the point of being kind of like brainwashed by this artifact. Like if you look at it through like a human perspective, you can also argue that he is a really bad parent because like not everything is about science. It's about like with like holding the human component of like being a human, especially in a time that like is. Right. But if he wasn't super in control either, like all of the beacon keepers who were captivated by this thing were, it were not in control of it. Right. That doesn't mean that it doesn't make him a bad person, though. Like, subjectively, <laughs> subjectively, it's like, oh, I couldn't help it. Right. But you still did this fucked up thing in my perspective. So you're a bad guy. Anyway, I'm not saying I'm like pro or anti this man. I just I'm just saying I'm anti Solomon and I'm pro Bart and everything else is subjective and necessary, I think. I think that's as much as we're going to learn about fruit in our <laughs> I know you're the only one who keeps caring about this man and his principle of being a father, which I do appreciate. I was just Paul. responding to one <laughs> comment that Paul made. And no, but it is really that, great how my, Paul, like, life. Paul is like, no, you guys, this guy who's barely around, this like, we're gonna, guy. yeah, like, what a I bad dad. Really... Let's shun him. So I know, get on board. <laughs> I think that it is both uh, thought trains are interesting. And then we will now lay Farouk to rest. I think so. I think he's done. (laughs) Do you have any theories on like how the next episode is going to play out with whatever clues or hints we had, like cliffhangers we've had at the end of this episode? Right. We have Halen in space with one rock. In his but ship. didn't he release it? I just watched the episode just before we recorded, and they just show him notice the rock. Like he picks it up and looks at it. But then and, it's passing. They show it passing through. Oh, you're, then you see, yeah, you're they right, show it outside. Right. Go after the cutter. It's a very fast scene, but the camera does go right up to the rock mm-hmm. and passes by super fast. And then Aster sees the artifact doing its beam ballet out and in space. And she starts talking to it. She starts trying to communicate to it. So there's the there's the artifact happening. There's the other humans that are not Aster kind of freaking out on the beak. And there's Halen, who's decided to pursue the two cutters that he knew about. And then two more cutters show up mm-hmm. behind him. So, yes. Yeah, now, now they're all framed up. <laughs> <laughs> with the end of the episode same question highness what do you think is going to happen next well i feel like we're about to get a cool display of what aster being a key looks like i think that she's about to communicate and we're gonna see this thing do something it could kill everybody including aster if it wants to it could absorb aster i don't know what happened to the first beacon keeper right so it could do some, whatever it wants but i'm expecting to see like a big display of this symbiotic relationship between aster and this thing and then I don't know if it's something that she could like influence and wield it as some kind of resource for like either weaponry or for enlightenment. I think that's like an obvious kind of thing, right? Because isn't this like the finale that we're about to watch? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Number eight will be the, at least the first season finale. No, but but the way that this wound up uh, offline, Gabby and I were chatting about it and it seems like they're angling for a story that could finish just the whole thing. You know, if they needed to end after one season, then whatever they're going to show us next, they're setting up enough that it could do that. That's what I thought. 
So I just kind of like look at all of this like um, uh, bird's eye view or just a very elevated view looking down on what we've seen. The journey we've been experiencing is this speaking is this, this entity. It's a life of isolation. It's a life of like lack of human interactions and how humans cope through various stages of that. Dealing with like the growth and changes and whatnot. And now we're at a stage of where the beacon as an entity is like severely depressed. We've got these QTA things coming in called cutters where this episode is really dark and it's it's very apparent to me that this is like a spiraling deep depression type of like medical crisis kind of equivalent right like from like a human perspective and so naming those things cutters to me was really interesting because of the high association of depression with self mutilation that's interesting well and a cutter then- is a ship it's a it is a kind of ship I get that. I'm just saying that like when we're looking at like themes and everything of what Bart was describing in this recent episode, the darkness at a core, feeling of loss, not feeling themselves, feeling empty, feeling rage. And it's a very common like description kind of feeling of somebody who's deeply depressed. And then feel final act of generosity, feeling tired. That's somebody who's like, you know, suicidal and wanting to like, I need to go because it's too much pain. I'm a burden on everybody else it, it'll the world will be better if i did this and then they starts with cutting it's the self-mutilation of like of hurting yourself to just feel something so it's just kind of interesting to me that we're going to bring in the ships with this specific name into this scenario so that's kind of where i've been like attaching that and then he does commit suicide or he goes through like a rock bottom kind of experience right he does hurt himself and basically like he ends his transmission so thank you from that so i'm hoping that what this next episode here is going to be like the light where like we did the suicide attempt but you're alive and have this other chance and there's like a purpose found in here and that maybe that's like somewhere here with with aster or could totally be or bar could totally just be done but i feel like the reboot and like you said with the key i'm hoping that he'll be back yeah, I'm getting the It's a Wonderful Life vibe, Paul. Okay. All right. <laughs> but no, I did have, you mentioned coping, Inez. And I wanted to, yes, bring up the drugs in this episode. And so are we like in agreement that this drug that's put into Cyborg Guy like is for like helping people sedate their emotional irrationality and keep them focused because like yeah at the end of the episode i'm like whoa everyone needs some drugs because they are freaking the fuck out and it is not the vibe not the vibe of beacon (laughs) i think that's fair that that's part of what that i mean it's some sort of dependence he has on a chemical that allows him to continue to do his hacking his kind of organic bio electrical hacking that he does with as uh what is what does Aster call it? The, the asshole in his neck or sphincter on his neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Funny. yeah. But yeah, that it did seem to have that effect so that he could calm his mind. And all of a sudden he was able to use his human brain to control the drones. And it looked like there was what, like 30, 40 drones or something like that. And the computer was having trouble doing it. And so he's like, okay, my brain can do it, but only after I have the drug. Yeah, and I I think that that has been a theme throughout just anytime someone gets emotionally unstable, like in their own opinion, they get the drug because that's like damage. So, you know, there's no PTSD because there's no room for coping. There's no time to process. It's just do or die. And if you're not doing, take this drug. (laughs) So they dull it out at the source. Yeah, and I think that they, like, where is this drug at the end? Because I was, like, not about the panic. You want a sphincter neck? (laughs) No, I mean, even, even, (laughs) I would love that, right? Yeah, no, they have the patches, but. Maybe this dude's beyond patches. He's He is beyond patches because he's a He's he's the freebasing cokehead. He's (laughs) He's one of the OGs. That's how you can tell, like, the level of severity of somebody's addiction that is usually associated with their levels of pain. And And he's a cyborg. Hmm. So we had some, like, little oil for his gears. 
Oh, you think that that's what it is? It was gear oil? <laughs> yes. Yes, with a little bit of magic potion that, like, But that guy in human. episode two was Sophie Olive, right? That He didn't, he wasn't bio man. Yeah, yeah, I know that. That's what I'm saying. There's, like, a version of this drug for everybody and that everybody needs to have it if they're on mission. Mm. Like, to, in order to survive and cope with right. space, it's not coping because of all the things that you mentioned. Yeah, and Harmony's data is that these panicky, depressed, anxiety stuff don't exist. PTSD doesn't exist. Right, because and, it's and, panicated. Right, so... I feel like that's kind of where you kind of see from an AI perspective, maybe there's some flawed data because those things clearly do exist, but from a computer perspective, it's told it doesn't exist because people are taking these things and, or whatever. But like, like from the data, data set, it's just, right, the data is like that. They just don't exist, okay? So when oh. you are told that they just don't exist and then you're experiencing it as like a real human, you're like, clearly this does exist, but let me get my medication in there to do it. So that's like the the masking. So she's like a flat earther, uh, but for <laughs> but for PTSD, she, okay. she's been, she's yeah. been no. fed just that. bad data no, and I'm only pretty- believes <laughs> She is owned by QTA. Right. Um, That's what I right? mean. So, She's yeah, indoctrinated exactly. into the into this one data set. Yeah, but there's nobody though who is just like, hey, let me not take this drug so I can be effective, you know? Nobody's trying to be the like advocate for like mental illness like in this world. They're all like, yep, we're on the bandwagon. It doesn't exist because it can't exist because we'll die. Give me another pharma patch. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how- exactly. Everyone's drinking the Kool-Aid. That is exactly how like everybody grows up now. If you're not exhibiting happy emotions, then you just need to put that shit away. Uh, no, no, we do definitely have plenty of people. Our, our society is not that. <laughs> There's plenty of advocacy for other stuff. But I did have one question about the, like, religion. All right. So Kier is part of this, like, group, right? Tries mm-hmm. to bomb the beacon because, you know, he was saying that, like, this type of world destroys humanity, takes away the purpose for people or whatever but then after he talks to bart there's some type of enlightenment so you're saying that he must have already been part of this group or do you think that after he went to prison for 10 years came out or maybe while he was in prison he they like started this religion was that the beginning of the religion and then if so like uh, where would they have i'm just really curious as the root of like what this message is are these people who you know, they're saying that there's a message that needs to, there's a message or a purpose. Do you think that any of that's real, that the artifact actually like contacted them at all? Or do you think that this is just like a bunch of lonely people in space trying to find a purpose? And he came up with a story that's so interesting that people jumped on that bandwagon. I think having been sent out as a terrorist potential suicide bomber, I mean, it wasn't going to, it wasn't designed to be suicide, but he was prepared to make it suicide if it came to that. I think he was part of the column as part of their belief system of anti-expansionism and that sort of thing, which is sort of what Saldana has going for her now. However, in some of the things that he said while he was on the beacon included that he knew about the artifact and that relics existed of the artifact, but he seemed to treat them more like things he had heard about at work, (laughs) you know, sort of like rumors, but he wasn't fully in that belief system yet until Bart gave him like the long story about his exposure to the relic and the artifacts. And then that and his long time in prison converted him. Yeah, I think that that is a huge origin component of what it looks like now. Whatever the people might have been forming back then in their ideologies, he came along with a little bit more concrete experience because he's getting this information from an AI that he found remarkable. Yeah. But the concept of like needing to bring everybody back together, we spread out too far kind of stuff was an ideology that was that already existed by then and i don't know how though they've tied the artifact into this because i feel like the artifact could have zero to do with whatever their agenda is i feel like the artifact be like fuck all of you like i just have my own biological purpose that i'm taking care of over here for these billions of years oh that's probably true i mean 
Yeah, yeah sorry, that was my question. Why would it care about? Right. So us? I think that yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm sure that the evolution of the religion had to have come from that experience if he kept on mission to eventually build himself up to a point of credibility to where they allocate precious resources to this Beacon 23 mission. So I think that there is like the origin there. I don't necessarily think that they're related, but... Right. So yeah, that was kind of my question. It was, um, did this religion exist prior? And if so, like, why did they decide to jump on the bandwagon for the beacon, for the artifact? And, and I guess like you answered that it's kind of like, this is a, this is an entity that exists and these people already were lost and like just needed to find purpose. And so this is just kind of like a... Mm-hmm. A coincidence that this yeah. guy is like hey group of people yeah you, you can't explain it so it must be important to us yeah. and it gives all of them purpose at that point i mean it worked for various religions throughout the history of man why not in the future of man right yeah it is the like human tendency Right. To like seek purpose. And that's why bart like didn't have a reason to live was because he said that he couldn't have faith and like humans can have faith so again maybe this is like an ai versus human biological like storyline which like which one is more successful and which one is better off and more effective in in life in existence i suppose right because Aleph wants to continue existing and he feels like the only way i mean okay so the transcendence part like mm-hmm. that better come up in next in the next episode seems like it right mm-hmm are it we gonna logical. see him? Are we gonna see him? Well, we is had... he gonna bring Bart back? I Bart's if... his baby too. I wonder if that's a component of their religion that hasn't come up yet, right? Oh, Olive yes. Is convinced that transcendence through the artifact is his goal, right? It for for all of humanity. But does the column even know that's on the table? <laughs> yeah, with Sophia Big Mouth, right? Because she was the only one who knew and. I don't know if Bart told Olive about that. Right. Yeah, and she had kids. So, like, did she tell her kids about anything? Didn't seem like they chatted very much. And afterlife is a big selling point of religions in general. Transcendence possibly being like a forever afterlife that can actually happen. That does seem like a very major tentpole aspect of that religion. But but we haven't been told that that's true yet. There had to have been stories, though. That makes a lot more sense as to, like, why the religion or this group of people, like, ended up existing or being created, like, early on until here, I guess, decided to feed them information that made them maybe grow a lot faster. But maybe it became, like, it was like a myth or a legend, an urban legend, and then it became a religion. Okay, that's interesting. So we're going to see a big dog fight in space, which, okay, so that was really funny in this episode when Lady Mercenary was just, like, such a hard ass and then all of a sudden is super nice to Halen and is like, we need you, we can use your skills. And I'm like, woman, how the fuck do you know his skills? Are you just, like, reading his little thing and it says, I'm a good pilot? Like, <laughs> why are you so, like, why is this guy your Achilles heel right now? And then at the end I'm like, oh, okay, dog fight, got it. Finally, we're going to see him, like, actually be like useful in in his best way (laughs) totally agree with with that that come on was like completely absent of any compelling argument we could use you yeah you in particular super I, I, i i need to be used i feel like i could be used why not for you it was so exactly right i mean he was used He was used by Aster, you know, for the -the round-the-clock, like, monitoring. So, you know, what... I mean, what... So, it's like, what other choices do you have, right? Like, what's the point of, like, getting really violent or anything? Well, he's got his transgalactic ship now, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he did leave or whatever, and it was, like, fine. You know, they got bigger fish to fry at this point. They've got to, one, stay alive while they're, like, on BART falling apart. Um, And then now, yeah, they've got these cutters on their way. Oh, so that's interesting, right? So in the story, she's talking to Bart and she says that, and this, this, their conversation, her conversation with Bart, like, did make me cry a lot, especially when she's being so goddamn fucking insensitive to Bart and not even fucking realizing it. I was like, shut up, shut up, Aster, you're making it worse when she's saying that, like, 
oh, living on the beacon is worse than like living out in the world with no purpose. <laughs> I'm just like, Jesus Christ, be like Bart already established that he's basically the beacon. And you're just like, nobody gives a fuck about you, Bart. Like, why? Yeah. Anyway, so I'm like, bitch, shut the fuck up so that my guy like stays <laughs> around. And then she didn't do that, but whatever. Anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, it was really interesting oh, yeah, how, funny. and I'm like crying as I'm, I'm like legit crying when I was watching all that. Sorry, sorry. I'm just like, the, all these quotes of like Bart are just coming out that are like making me want to cry. Anyway, okay. So it's interesting that she says this and then Bart mentions, why did Halen leave? Which was already kind of weird to me that this whole time he's like being pulled and wanting to stay because he has a friend but then all of a sudden like he got more friends Halen got more friends and he's like actually I don't like you guys I'm gonna leave now like that was kind of weird like it just did feel a little bit rushed in a couple of scenes but it's okay I forgave it anyway so then he leaves but then he decides to come back and so I think that's like really nice to follow the theme which was Aster decided to stay even knowing that like whatever's out there is better than staying on the beacon like she chose to stay and then he decided to i don't know be out of character and not be super loyal and then go but then he decided okay apparently the beacon is worth more than whatever else there is like whatever attempt at hope there may be from leaving and so that's why i do think like i agree with i think i was saying this earlier that is gonna somewhat come around to be some kind of like happy ending that does give like people a purpose but i don't know all of this season has been super dystopian so <laughs> maybe um it's not going to all work out and there probably are going to be some crazy twists that are going to make me cry but as long as bart exists i guess i'll be okay maybe but anyway, so I just thought that was really interesting that everyone's just like bitching about how the beacon's the worst place ever. But then at this point, you start seeing people choosing to be here. And it is like, again, the theme that Bart mentioned earlier, it is like beacons like does mean like safety. Um, and it does like inherently um, like protect and save people. And it is providing of light. Yeah, I assume that Aster said that because of the upcoming battle was like the odds were like stacked against them, that it wasn't that the beacon itself was a terrible place. It was just like for what they're about to face right now, the odds are against you and a good chance you're going to die. So this is more terrible to be here right now about to encounter these cutters from QTA than to like Jet. You don't think she always was ready to face death, though? she is you can still be ready to face death because she's got her mission and she's like i'm in too deep i have to do it i have to see it through but he doesn't have that obligation he's just been like helping her because what else is he going to do and so like now it's like we're about to have like a real fight like then so this right now <laughs> yeah and he decides like he's too afraid and she's like all right i mean he's like this lady mercenary is crushing on me and i'm uncomfortable so i'm gonna leave <laughs> <laughs> it was just I've weird. never thought for a so moment that she was character. crushing on him. I'm like, bitch, why do you like him so much? You don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? So you're funny. giving me. I don't get a sense of that at all. You're giving me homage of 300, where ironically, Lena, who plays Lady of that guy, Gerard Butler's <laughs> character. <laughs> Right? Like, she's, like, there at her last stand, and she's like, hey, all you people who aren't scared, like, I'm here. Are you going to be a bitch, or are you going to stay? So what's going to happen? Are they going to get annihilated with honor, or will they prevail? Gabby is a Spartan in her soul. I am. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> you and Bart. And I know. Thank you. So Harmony was barely in this episode. And her presence was not totally useful. I really liked Harmony's interactions. She was the only one checking in on Bart's well-being. Yeah, she's not an asshole. She was the only one who was just like coming to him and being like, are you okay? And then trying to help him through coping with what's going on, right? She's saying, just let it go. Like whatever's happened in the past has happened. Let's focus now on the present right. and future. Well, I didn't see it as like that, like sympathetic. 
it, it may have not been sympathetic. It may have just been objective, but it was still something. And I don't know. I felt like she, I felt like she was like gentle with him in, oh, yeah. in everything. She knows that he's broken. She sees that how he's physically broken. And then she's also is the only person checking in on what is his well-being and this given point in time. And then actually trying to give him some solutions or some ways around it. And nobody else does that for him. I Everybody know. just Acid listens to him. Episode. They just watch him spiral and then are just like, please stop spiraling, right? Or push him over. Right. It's not helpful when somebody's going through a crisis, a personal crisis, a depressive crisis. Ironically, it's the dumb emotional humans that are being assholes to our Bart, to my Bart. Anyway, though, and Harmony did give us good information, you know, because, yeah, she is showing this sympathy toward Bart and trying to help him, which is why I think she's going to be in the next episode, like a really big player with bringing him back and putting his pieces together because Halen's just going to like kind of be the dummy that has the key. And then she's going to be like, thank you for that. Let me do everything for you now. And then it's, it's going to work out for Bart. <laughs> but also <laughs> she did tell us though, like she did explicitly say that the beacon changes everything, including AI. Right. And so that was a huge part of the entire plot, which was essential. So it was not about the quantity, but the quality of her presence, I think. Fair enough. I guess at the beginning of the episode, isn't it something like she was basically helping or entirely running the beacon? Oh, yeah. And then at the end, she's like, I can't do shit. So maybe the sympathy was also a little bit like, I'm not really a beacon keeping AI. <laughs> I, I need yeah, help. Yeah, she's just an assistant. Absolutely. Right. This is your job and you're much better at it than me. <laughs> So I don't want to stay on this beacon. Can you get your shit together done. already? Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I was, yeah. Cause she is an assistant AI and she does trying to figure things out. And it was really weird to me that they did look into like his history and like, why didn't she notice? I mean, actually she did early on. She did notice that he was super damaged and that there were things missing, but I am yeah. curious as to like why they never asked like why she never asked about it, but I guess maybe she was trying to. And I, he was like, I think just it was just really because the uh, well, she came on the same day that those pirates, right, or the next day. It was like very soon after, and then the pirates they fucked up his programming first. Remember that guy had that thing coming out of his arm and that yeah, plugged that right in or something, right? Tube thing. She came out before, I think. Yeah, she came Right, out but like, there's no reason for her to go dig into looking at those things. And then she only really started, we only started seeing her interact with him after he was already compromised by the other thing. So I think that it's logical to kind of assume that this is like related. Um, and they're just now finding this because now Bart's giving right he's now getting the flashbacks or he now he's like revealing truths about his trauma with Solomon right he was a terrible man and he's like kind of like he got triggered through a, like all of this and that's why he spiraled yeah but I'm just still like she knew that he was broken she knew that he was not broken but she knew that he was um compromised I just feel like it would have been cool or or kind of expected for her to like mention a, I mean she did though. She did mention that like he was compromised and that like he was different but then she kind of like shrugged him off a lot because he was also like annoying. But I don't know, just like kind of being kind of curious, right? Because he only had data until like up until Solomon and that Solomon happened right before this. So I don't know. I just think it's a little suspicious that she wouldn't have been like, wow, you don't have any data and the beacons existed because like they know that the beacons been around for like 200 years. Right. That's weird. I think that's kind of like a plot hole that I hope they like fill in. Well, speaking of the next episode, it feels like it's going to have a lot of action, right? We have the beacon kind of falling apart. We have the cutters. We only have one ship out there on our team, which is Halen. We've been told he's this kick-ass soldier and pilot. <laughs> yes. Um, we've seen only a little smidgen of that. And he's not exactly like Captain America here. He's he's fallible. He's not like a one-man wrecking crew kind of thing. He's no. not a superhero. He loses charge fast. Basically, yeah. He hasn't even charged up. Reg that too. 
I think there will be a dogfight, but your point about the key um, needing to get back to the beacon seems to imply that he's that that that's got to be kind of short lived because he's got to. I don't know that he can kill all four of them, but he's got to get past whoever he doesn't kill and get back to the beacon. Or somehow send the little thing over, toss it in the little storage <laughs> thing so that they can get access to it. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to happen, but it is. It is going to happen. It has to. And then there's got to be like, like the spiritual or something, supernatural, maybe is the better word, aspect with Aster and the artifact. Yeah, what's the artifact going to do? Is it going to just like suck up? The is it a like a black hole? Is it gonna take form? What form is it gonna be? I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then Olive, he might show up, and I mean, this is what he's here for. This is what he was looking for. Come on, Q. Yeah, yeah. Take your children with you. This like column religious group, but I don't know. He, I think he'd be disappointed, but maybe not. Bart's last words though. Like, I only want to help. I'm done being the weak link. This is just too hard. It's really ironic and special to me because I'm always on the AI side <laughs> that he has been. And, you know, we've talked about this. You guys have mentioned it before. He has been the most, like, human character throughout the entire show. So those being his last words... And then all the humans just being like, okay, cool, bye. Like, let's still get the show on the road. I think that's a super unique take compared to all of the, or most shows that have AI. I think iRobot was also similar to this, where it was like that moral dilemma. Actually, no, mm -hmm. maybe Haley Joel Osment um, in Artificial Intelligence also like had some kind of moral dilemma with like humans just being like Inez, who were like, you're a robot and you just have a purpose and you can't evolve <laughs> on your own. And if you do, we're going to reset you. I just hope that you have, you, you give some time to reflect Inez <laughs> after this. <laughs> poor Inez. She's so taking insensitive on the chin here. to these poor, poor <laughs> AIs so all the time. See? <laughs> She's a horrible <laughs> human, okay? She's like that that mercenary man in the beginning that Aster murdered. <laughs> I'm like, and you I'm got Bart. a job to do for me. She is <laughs> Solomon. You got an <laughs> And exactly oh, how I man. felt where I'm like, I grieve for Solomon. I thought he loved me, but he hurt me. So like him being dead isn't enough. I feel you, Bart. Oh. And this is like, have you tried turning it off and back on again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What a DV. <laughs> that is 100% me. I'm like, Jesus. I got like things to do. <laughs> you are really? like, this, is, this tool, I was told this tool is for me to use to maximize my success at productivity and blah, blah, blah. So that's what I'm using it for. That's what it's for. If it's not doing that, then it's not working. See, Paul, that's <laughs> why she doesn't. Then it needs to be reset. That's why she doesn't <laughs> like the that's why she doesn't think homie is a piece pos like daddy guy right she's one of them now we know i can't wait for next episode <laughs> gonna battle it out yeah farut's gonna come back and be like aster i'm here farut is here <laughs> <laughs> oh my god please do not bring Farouk back <laughs> and Solomon in Inez oh, form man. I would not mind seeing Solomon again <laughs> but oh, yeah, well, I, I mean, think we the Farouk conversation his, we saw his corpse I mean that's pretty close yeah we did yeah, yeah that was kind of cool so that Bart can do something about it <laughs> <laughs> turn your body into in, cum. yeah incinerate him Bart <laughs> get your fill <laughs> <laughs> get your sense of justice so yeah. that we can move on yeah, yeah yeah get your little bug to like get into solomon to wake him up so you yeah. can turn him off again charge him up and maybe <laughs> puppet his body around a little bit there you go it's all for bart <laughs> i'm really glad that this is how we're wrapping up this episode <laughs> this is a good stopping point Thank what you. did you call it right. justice for bart right <laughs> <laughs> we, we want to go full zombie next episode. Just pull out all the stops. I cannot wait. Did you see the movie Sunshine? Uh, Danny Boyle no. movie? Oh. I did not, but it sounds fantastic if you're talking about human zombie puppets. I don't want to spoil it, but there's a bit of that in there. 
like that. There's a Zombie bit of that in there, that's for sure. You don't see it coming. Oh, nice. Yep. Anyhow, back to this space adventure. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of action. Some supernatural stuff. Dog fights. Yeah, some dog fights. Um, the visuals for the space aspects of the show are, are dazzling, but short, I've noticed. They don't overdo it. They don't hang out in space a lot if they don't have to. Yeah. You think that's budget-wise? I do. Uh... I do, yeah. Even though that kind of thing isn't ex- as expensive as it used to be, I don't think. But still, I think it's going to be a short dogfight. Whatever whatever his, you know, elevated status of this uh, super soldier pilot guy, <laughs> it's going to work out in a couple of couple of shots, I think, before he's back on the beak and be like, hey, I got this ring and you need that ring? The ring sounds important. Oh my gosh, so now it's giving Game of Thrones vibes, which which is like, oh, this is about dragons, and then not really. Yeah, that's sad. <laughs> that's... <laughs> yeah. Right. Drogon shows up, <laughs> blasts the beacon, flies back off with Daenerys' body in his mouth. Oh my god. I just watched the South Park three episode of Game of Thrones last night. <laughs> Where they cut off his <laughs> dick. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, Butters, like, continues anger of, like, where are the fucking dragons coming? Yeah, and they're coming, they're coming. <laughs> that shit. So stupid. That's Thank hilarious. you, South Park. Thank you. I'm still mad. Like, I still can't even, like... I was thinking about episode. you so much, Gabby. <laughs> when I was watching it, just like hearing your constant rants and butters, butters is that same rant. It's so funny. It's not a rant; it's the truth. Uh, well, for a while there weren't very many dragons. That's for sure. That's for yeah, sure. Let's stop. Let's stop. Stop talking about that trash. And then All right, let's go. One last thing, though. Oh my gosh! I just looked up the cast of Sunshine, and I am going to watch it today. I'm so excited. Thank you, Paul. Captain America's in that one, for crying out loud. Yeah, but he's like the least important person no, he's in not that in, cast. He, oh my gosh. He's uh, he's not Beautiful even people very here. likable in it. But um, yeah. Oh, well, that's good. I, I think he's a good actor. So that's nice when he plays something that's not Captain America-esque. But like everybody, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It's a good cast. Good movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great cast. Mark Strong, too. Like, like when he... Okay, okay. Anyway, Ode to Bart. We love Bart. Thank Paul, you for can listening. We do... <laughs> <laughs> we should do a uh, we should do another recording, but like with sunshine and something All right, else. Anyway, let's really wrap this up first. All right, we can do that. We can do that. So I think we are pretty well talked out on this one. Any... You no, know, we could go for ages, but oh, do you have some closing sure. thoughts, Gabby? No, it's just going to be more love on Bart. <laughs> you guys aren't interested in that. Okay, but let's no, officially say the chronological order of things, right? So it was Avalon, and then the bomber and Sophie soon after, like within 10 years, and then however long she's there. And then a huge-ass gap. Yes. So yeah, that's one thing that I think we failed to mention, which was that we all, I, or at least I think you and I assumed that the um, Beacon was like always, always had residents on there, and now yeah. we know there are like decades gaps. <laughs> of right. gaps. Exactly. So it was Avalon, Sophie Olive, and then Astor's family 50 years later, or 150 years later, and then the bomber to Halen was pretty much like a 10-year gap. With Bomber, Solomon, Halen, right. Yeah, yeah. So between the Bomber, yeah. But I I think 10 years sounds right there, yeah. That is interesting as to like why the beacon was empty for so many years between Sophie and Astor's family. And then they really fucked up by putting like a lady and a guy there. Yeah, yeah. To reproduce. Question is, would this miracle have happened if there were two women or two men? Would the artifact <laughs> somehow have like uh, made that possible? Good question. <laughs> but yeah, you're, that 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 is an interesting. I mean, that asks that asks another kind of amusing side question: is like, who in HR put this this like. Uh, work wreck together that managed to get so many bad fits for this this deal because Astor's parents didn't work out I mean they abandoned their post and then Solomon had certain issues that uh maybe from a 
maybe from a work aspect, he was great from, but as, as a, a judge of character, he, he was a lousy guy. I think they wanted that though. You think so? Oh yeah. Cause they sent him there to reset Bart like assholes. Are we ever going to, s- oh, we are going to see them. They're coming. They're the cutters. Okay. How do you feel about Bart though? Like Bart's character and personality and human component and his like mental breakdown. He'd rather feel pain than nothing at all, Paul. It comes at an interesting time in Hollywood. AI is being cast as a devil in disguise. The recent strikes for both actors and writers each had aspects to them that that were concerned with AI and they weren't going to go back to work until those concerns were addressed. Whether it was for writers, studios using AI in place of writers, or for actors using AI in place of actors. So to have sort of this AI sympathetic story come out of Hollywood right now, I think it's kind of interesting. His role in this story is huge and it does have a very human feel to it. I mean, he is, for all intents and purposes, a human that's kind of restricted to the confines of the beacon and the beacon's responsibilities, but he's had a lot of other kinds of human reactions to things, uh, especially his willingness to compartmentalize the truth and then deceive when it fits his purpose. That is a scary aspect that we, as people living in 2023, don't want to think that our machines can do. We only want to think that, that people can have that ability. I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm underestimate the, the, def- the definitely guilty of being Solomon in this kind of And that's of where we end it. Here. Thank you. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> and like Solomon, no regrets. <laughs> right. I was right, like, where's the fucking power cord on this thing? <laughs> now, you heard about those frustrations she was talking about? That, that was that was geared toward me, right? Was that your sentiment toward me? Was, was I Bart and you're Sullivan? You're like, this bitch. And then you're like, no. oh, I, can't, I couldn't find the button, so let me just accept it and move on. Bart is <laughs> Chad GPT for me. <laughs> What an insult to Bart. I did appreciate, okay, last thing, I did appreciate how Harmony was re- is really, like, defensive for the AI, right? Like, so sh- I appreciated that she was, like, I wouldn't call it judgy, but, you know, Aster was, like, throwing a little fit, and she says she didn't want judgment right now, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then Harmony's like, like, yeah, I know. You're never in the mood for that, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Never <laughs> in the mood for judgment. Yeah, I appreciated her going through all the advice and being like, but you're not going to listen, so no advice for you, then. Thank you, Harmony, for being the only person that really kept it real, I guess. And she is AI, so that is expected. But she she did end up caring the most about Bart. She did end up saying, okay, Aster, like, you're just a crazy bitch. I'll just let you be crazy. It is interesting that she was wanting her to surrender. Do you think that that's because it's just, like, the best course of action for survival? Or do you think part of that was also because she does belong to QTA? And is like, hey don't go totally off mission do you think she's like rogue rogue ai i don't think she can be so you think she's more loyal to who well when aster was threatening to um abandon ship a couple weeks ago she was saying that she would need to stay behind because she's property of qta so yeah she's loyal to her programming I mean, both things can be true, but the stronger influence might be coming from her ultimate Mm -hmm. allegiance to her owners. Right. So I guess this is her version of Bart helping Halen, which is like officially, unofficially giving some Mm -hmm. feedback and advice. Like, because Bart unofficially helped him by telling him like what not to do in order to escape since he had orders to not let anyone off the ship. And so maybe Harmony is saying like, she has no advice because she knows that whatever Aster like has to do serves a greater purpose, but she can't officially say like, yeah, do this. And these are the possible outcomes because she's still property. Yeah, I can see that. Well, all right then. Well, all right then. Wow, this is our longest podcast yet. 90 minutes of pure gold. Exactly. You're Most welcome. Cool. All right. Well, then join us for the final episode of Beacon 23, where we will chat up about how everything 
came out. This has uh, been Paul with Pod Clubhouse. You can find Pod Clubhouse at Pod Clubhouse on Instagram and Twitter slash X and on Facebook and www.podclubhouse.com. Inez, where can people find you on socials if they wanted to reach out? I want to reach out. You can find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Nisi Thinks. I'll be attached to whatever pod clubhouse posting will be released. All right. That sounds good to me. And uh, Gabby's just one way. She's you, you listen to her and that's all she needs. <laughs> yeah, but also, you know, you know, you can you can maybe find me on YouTube at the Gabtastic. The Gabtastic. Yeah, that, that's a channel. It's existed. I'm going to use it. <laughs> okay. All right. The Gabtastic. I'll be checking that out. Is there, are there like unboxings and uh, ASMR videos or something on there? What, what's on there? <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Right now, it's just a bunch of random dumb shit. That is great. You know, some, some real original content from my high school, college days. No unboxing, just, just gold. <laughs> All right. All right. The Gabtastic. Got it. All right, well, then we'll uh, close out the season. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for listening. This has been an original Pod Clubhouse production. Pod Clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content. Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you. Pod Clubhouse.